I'm Sam Arnold and welcome to Frying Pans West. This is a show about the foods and drinks of the early West, the foods that the pioneers brought West with them and the foods that they met on the trail. The show uh, is going to deal with the preserved foods that were brought west and some of the items that uh, you can use today, uh, things that you can make with supermarket foods that are archaic in a fashion in that they're not generally eaten today, but they are the foods that your grandfathers and great-grandfathers ate, uh, especially if they were in the west. We're going to show you uh, a method of cooking salt pork, which is sort of the forgotten cousin in the supermarket. Uh, hopping John, which is a traditional southern dish that was brought west. Uh, how, to, how to do your own marrow bones, a very inexpensive and delicious dish that, uh, in fact, you can very often get the marrow bones for free from your supermarket. Then I'm going to show you how to cut jerky and uh, explain uh, how that's done, and pemmican, which is made from jerky. The uh, story of jerky is <clears throat> a very old one. Uh, jerky is nothing but sun-dried meat. It can be uh, deer meat or uh, elk meat, moose meat, any, any type of meat. Uh, today, the beef jerky that you find in most of the taverns around the country uh, is commercially made. Uh, you can get uh, buffalo jerky in some places in Wyoming. But to make your own is very simple. You simply start off with a big block of uh, uh, steak meat of some kind. Uh, you can use top round or bottom round or uh, any, th uh, any type of a uh, uh, moderately tender meat. And then take a sharp flat knife and cut down to within about a quarter of an inch of the bottom of the meat. Then turn your knife on its side and begin unrolling this. And you unroll it as you would, say, a jelly roll. And if you have a nice sharp knife, you need, of course, to be quite careful that you don't slice your fingers off. But by, by moving this down, you, you turn your block of meat into one big long strip or a couple of long thin pieces. Now, in the old days, the Indians didn't believe in cutting meat against the grain. And even many of the mountain men in the West felt that this was uh, uh, meat that they didn't want to eat. So they always cut it lengthwise with the grain. Of course, uh, when you're cutting jerky in this fashion, why uh, you have to just cut against all those 360 degrees around. And then you see you have one big long strip of meat. Then to make your jerky, you take a skewer and you hang it like this. You have to be sure that the edges don't touch one another while it's drying. And if you've cut it thin enough, then this, this will harden and in about three or four days uh, in a dry climate, it'll harden and be uh, uh, ready to eat. Now you can use this uh, as a snack uh, for when you're watching television, or you can use it for hiking, mountain climbing. Uh, you can reconstitute it very quickly by boiling it up uh, into a soup, uh, or use it in making stews. It has a, its own inimitable flavor in stew meat. Uh, if, if you're in an area where there are a lot of insects, why, you can cover this all over with some cheesecloth, and that keeps the bugs away. Uh, some people uh, who are... Uh, purists uh, refuse to uh, uh, add any salt or pepper to it. Uh, most people like to pound a little coarse ground black pepper into it and a little seasoned salt or plain salt. Uh, you can also, if you have a smoke oven, uh, give it a little dose of smoke uh, uh, flavor. The hickory or uh, apple wood makes a really, really fine uh, smoke taste. The jerky in the West uh, was also uh, used to make what they called the iron ration of the Indian, and this was pemmican. Uh, 
many of the fellows who were in the ski patrols during World War II and uh, mountain climbers today uh, buy commercially made pemmican. And of course, it was an old Indian dish. Uh, there's even a reference by Lewis and Clark on their trip west uh, to running into and eating pemmican. And it's a combination of jerky, uh, uh, suet or, or fat, uh, and cherries of some kind. Choke cherries are the most commonly used cherries uh, for making pemmican uh, in, historically. But if you don't happen to have choke cherries, you can use uh, red cherries, uh, Bing or the sour reds. And uh, take, your, take commercially made jerky or your own, toast it in an oven. Uh, these are some pieces of commercially made jerky that we bought. And then we toast it in the oven until it is almost black and it's crisp like bacon and it, it just breaks, breaks up in little pieces. Then put that into um, a meat grinder, break it up, and then take some fat. Now the, the best fat that you can get is suet from around the kidneys. And it is nice and, and white and pure and has very, very little flavor of its own, just, just a slight uh, beef taste. And put it all in through your grinder and add, add a couple cups of cherries. Keep mixing it through. And you may have to take the end off of your grinder because it tends to jam up unless you keep it well lubricated. And you can push it on down in here. And, it, and then it begins to squeeze out. And you can take, take, take this mixture. It's a one-third cherries, one-third fat, and uh, uh, a third jerky and form it into a ball. We've got some here that we were squeezing just a little bit earlier. And it has a really delicious taste if you make a ball out of it, kind of roll it up. And then you can, you can wrap these in uh, aluminum foil and take these along with you on a, on a trip. And they're good forever. They, they don't get rancid, they don't get bad, and, and it has a really very fine taste. The cherries give it a sharpness and a sweetness, and the, the jerky gives it a taste sort of like crisp bacon, and the fat, uh, um, well, it just is sort of like sausage. It, it, it really makes it very tasty. And it's a good one to take with you on trips. Mm. So good cherries. I used frozen cherries on that one. Now, uh, we're going to go over to the uh, other cooking set and show you uh, how they used to use salt pork. In the days of the uh, westward migration along the Oregon Trail, they used to, uh, the, the settlers going west, used to buy books that were put out by somebody who obviously had never been on the trail. And these were uh, lists of items that they're supposed to take west. Uh, and they used to take uh, great quantities of salt pork, uh, dried rice, uh, rice, uh, dried apples, uh, dried fruits of various sorts. And uh, the quantities that were listed as to be taken in the wagons were so large that by the time they got to uh, the area in eastern Wyoming called Fort Laramie, uh, their, their horses were all worn out. So they used to put uh, aside, uh, quite literally, tons and tons of salt pork right by the fort there and just leave it. They'd abandon it because if they expected to make the rest of the trip west, why, uh, they surely wouldn't get there carrying such heavy loads. Uh, someone made a lot of money selling uh, uh, emigrant books, uh, telling them what they should do, but the poor fellow had never been on the trail himself. Uh, the backbone of the western migration food was salt pork, and this, of course, was preserved uh, uh, in brine originally, and then uh, you, you actually had a crust of salt over it. Now, you can still find this in the grocery stores. It's, it sort of usually is hidden over in the side of the meat counter, and uh, not too many people buy it, but it's a really delicious, delicious uh, meat. and. There are only a few tricks that you need to know. One is uh, to soak this uh, overnight in water so as to remove a good portion of the salt from it. Now, if you haven't soaked it, uh, here's a technique that you can use to 
get rid of the salt taste. If you don't do that, why, it's going to be just too salty for you to, to eat. You cut the rind off the edge here. And you cut it into pieces so. And we'll cut them into bite-sized pieces now. You get a couple of kettles of really good hot boiling water ready and you'll put these in a colander and then pour the boiling water over them. Let's see, I've got this here. Spread them around so that the water can hit it pretty evenly. And take a, a couple of kettles of boiling water and over your sink, just pour the, the water over it, move it around, and uh, about two kettles of boiling water like that will remove most of the, the salt from it. Then throw it into a frying pan and let it start to, let it start to fry. We'll turn this on almost to full up, and you want it nice and browned. Then after this is brown, I'll show you how to make the, the gravy. Now another dish that they used to eat a lot in the frontier was marrow bone. They used buffalo primarily, uh, whatever game they had, but buffalo was the ba basic staple of uh, the frontier. And uh, eating of marrow is not strictly uh, a Western idea. It's been done in, I guess, about every country. In England, you can buy these uh, marvelous marrow scoops that look like a cheese scoop, and they, they serve uh, roasted or broiled marrow uh, for what we would call dessert or a savory and it's not a sweet item at all. And I got the butcher to take these, uh, this, this shin bone and, and cut it into two pieces. Uh, this is the easy way. Usually the, the stores will charge you maybe three or four or five cents a pound for these things, and uh, many friendly butchers will give them away to you at no cost at all. And just throw them into a uh, Pyrex uh, pan like this and take them into the broiler. In the days of the early West, they used to uh, they used to call this prairie butter. And you have a nice overhead heat. There we go. I'm going to leave that up so you can hear it sizzle. And prairie prairie butter, uh, the the marrow spread over bread, a uh, crisp hard roll, is really a very fine, uh, say, Sunday night supper dish, uh, a very good one to eat. Now our salt pork is getting brown. The French Canadian voyageurs, the, the men who came in the canoes in the, into the North Country and were the uh, French Canadian trappers, uh, used a lot of salt pork too. And then, of course, uh, they, they very often uh, called uh, the... Uh, uh, the soldiers, the American soldiers, uh, mangeurs du lard, or eaters of, of lard, pork eaters. Uh, some of the American soldiers were also uh, called other names, too, uh, having to do with uh, pork by the French Canadians who were in opposition. Now, after you, after you get these fried up, I'm going to cook them a little higher heat now for a moment, and uh, then I'll make the gravy to go with it. The uh, uh, southerners who came west uh, were quite accustomed to uh, black-eyed peas. Uh, this was primarily a, a, a vegetable found in the south and today is uh, traditional to the south. The black-eyed peas when mixed with with coconut uh, and rice makes a very fine dish which they used to call hopping john 
this was traditionally a New Year's Day dish, uh, usually served in the late morning or uh, during New Year's main meal at noontime. Uh, the story being that children would uh, go around the table uh, uh, doing a little dance and then they would eat Hopping John and this would bring good luck for the whole coming year. Uh, an easy way, of course, to make Hopping John is to get yourself uh, black-eyed peas, uh, roughly, uh, this, this is a, a normal, um, what is it, two and a half size can, uh, about... Uh, a cup and a half of black-eyed peas. Then uh, I've prepared a little rice. And you put the peas into the rice. And then, this is a bit more coconut than we should have, uh, about a cup of coconut for a cup and three quarters of the uh, peas. And then we'll add and mix the coconut, the black-eyed peas, and the rice together. I'm going to add a little bit of water. It's about a cup of water there. Now, I have already cooked this rice, but uh, uh, for your own self, you can uh, just put uh, uh, rice at a ratio of uh, one and a third water to one part of rice and then add your black-eyed peas and your coconut and let it cook. And I think I'll put it over here and we can let that heat up. Now our, you see how nice and crispy brown these things are getting? And that's the good part about salt pork. They're sort of, sort of like uh, bacon crisps. Now we'll take a third of a cup of flour and just add that, sprinkle it around and add it in. And let the, let the fat cook into the flour. It'll give you a nice roux. And it's getting good, hot then add milk to make yourself a cream gravy. About a cup of milk. And this will boil down and make a thick, nice gravy with a crisp bacon or salt pork taste in, into it. Then add some, uh, let's see, I had some black pepper here. Here we go. Put a whole batch of black pepper in it, again, according to your own taste, but it's delicious that way. You don't need any salt because you, your salt pork is already Now there's your gravy. Getting a little thick. I'll add a little bit of water to this. Now, let's take a look at our marrow bones. And indeed, they are just about ready. Let's see. Yeah. And this is the way you serve them right to the table. Get yourself a good hot plate in the bottom of your table. And the marrow is nice and brown. Of course, when you, when you put this on a big plate, why, well, you're going to need uh, some kind of tongs to put them on. This makes a very impressive dish for a, for a Sunday night. slide around like crazy.
Now you use some crisp bread, put that along with it, and then uh, your guest will uh, take this marrow and spread it over the bread. And it's just like, just like butter. Just throw some on and, and it's good. Now well, salt pork. Make a serving here. And we'll use some of the Hop and John. Another side dish. The salt pork goes very well with the the um, rice and the hop and john. And for a bit of decoration, some parsley flakes. And there is a frontier meal that probably your granddaddy's ate. Marrowbone, salt pork, and Hoppin' John. Now, in this series, we do all sorts of uh, the different dishes of the early West, and we're. I'm, I want to show you, however, uh, a cookbook that we've produced. This uh, is called, uh, obviously, Frying Pans West, and uh, it is a compilation of all the recipes that we have in the uh, series. And if you are interested in getting a copy of this cookbook, I simply uh, uh, watch the, at the end of this program, and your station will show you how you can uh, obtain one of them. Uh, this has about 45, 50 different recipes in it for both food and drink of the early West, Indian foods, uh, uh, early American, uh, Southern, and New England foods, and then the Mexican foods as well. The, uh, uh, in the days of the early West, it was pretty important for a man to know how to shoot a gun. And because so many of the youngsters today think that uh, uh, guns always came with bullets in them, uh, the cartridge-type bullet, uh, I brought along an old 1861 uh, Springfield rifle. I also brought along a, uh, a Marlin Buffalo gun. And this, this is a Pacific uh, Marlin uh, made about 1871. It has an octagonal barrel, and I'd like to show it to you. We were out shooting this uh, not very long ago. A friend brought over some of the cartridges for this one. And uh, you see it drops down so. And you put a cartridge in here. And it's a great big long thing. It's about, uh, well, I guess the cartridge is about two and a half inches long. And it's full of black powder and has a, a lead uh, bullet at the end of it. And you shove it in just one at a time. And then pull this back. And you have a set trigger. The set trigger you pull back to cock. And then, of course, when you let her go, I blam away. A uh, great big cloud of black smoke comes out of the front. Uh, this this heavy a barrel gun was used uh, with a 45 caliber bullet. It was used for shooting uh, uh, buffalo at quite a long distance. Of course, originally the buffalo, uh, being uh, the basic uh, staple animal on the prairie, uh, was killed by the Indians by uh, pumping arrows into them, they'd ride alongside and shoot them with arrows, and then very often they'd take a long club on the end of a stick and they would brain the buffalo that had been wounded. Uh, Kit Carson had a good reputation for being a fine uh, supplier of buffalo meat to expeditions, such as Fremont's expedition. Uh, the reason that he was able to uh, command such a high price for his uh, services was that Carson knew how to get into the uh, front center of a buffalo herd. And the buffalo herds uh, uh, are usually headed by the great big bulls in the front, and then right behind them are the uh, younger cows. The younger cows are the best eating, of course. Then as you go uh, further back in the herd, you have the, the young bulls, and uh, then the 
big old timers are the, are the stragglers. And of course the stragglers are the easiest ones to get, uh, but they don't taste as good on the table. Uh, buffalo is like beef, but better in flavor. And there are now about 60,000 animals uh, uh, in both private and public herds around the country. The, the cost of buffalo is substantially more, and buffalo steaks, for example, and I, I happen to own a restaurant in Colorado, uh, and we serve buffalo steaks. Uh, buffalo steaks uh, run about $7 and a half, uh, uh, figuring a normal restaurant markup. The uh, cost is between uh, $2.50 and $3 a pound, uh, and, and even at today's high prices of beef, why this is a pretty good pretty goodly amount. Now, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, with the old 1861 Springfield, how you load uh, a muzzle loader. This gun was at Gettysburg, and uh, it says U.S. Springfield 1861 model. Later on, they had a trapdoor model, but this was a, a simple musket. And in fact, they found many of these with as many as eight or nine loads. The fellows were so scared during the battle that they, they kept loading them and loading them and loading them and never shot them. And if they had ever fired them with so many uh, bullet and powder loads in them, why, of course, the gun would have blown up. But if you want to have fun uh, and you're a black powder enthusiast, uh, you get a flask like this. This is a, a flask made by Dixon, uh, Dixon and Sons in England. And I found this near... Um, uh, wagon Mound, New Mexico, and you can, this is a measuring device on the top of your powder flask, and you have black powder, and if you just want to make a bang without uh, actually putting a mini bullet in it, you grab your paper, and chew up your paper a little bit, and that'll give you your wad. Then, take this and put it down into the gun and there's a particular clunk that it gets when it's packed down nicely yep. now if you were going to load that with a bullet you'd put the bullet down uh, on top of a patch after after your powder then they have caps that are fulminate of mercury caps and these these are made of copper I don't know uh, perhaps if I get this box, you can see them all. They're, these are French musket caps, still made today. And the little top of this thing is uh, fulminated mercury inside. Then we'll put the cap on top here and pull her back. And going to suggest to you that you tune in to Frying Pans West next week on the same channel at the same time. Uh, we're going to have quite a, an interesting show of uh, early Indian foods on the, on the next one. So please do tune in if you have any ears left after, after we bang this thing off. Uh, we, we blew out one microphone a little bit uh, ago, but so here she goes.